Welcome to the Business Scholarship Podcast, interdisciplinary conversations about new works in the broad world of business research. I'm your host, Andrew Jennings. If you like what you hear today, please consider subscribing to the podcast or sharing with others who might like it too. And if you have ideas for future episodes, let me know. My email address is andrew at andrewkjennings.com, and I look forward to hearing from you. Our guest today is Roberta Carmel, professor of law at Brooklyn Law School. This is the first half of a two-part interview on her career as a security scholar, teacher, regulator, and practitioner. As an incoming professor at Brooklyn Law myself, it's a personal honor to have her on the show. Roberta, welcome to the Business Scholarship Podcast. Thank you. You grew up in Chicago and graduated from Radcliffe College in 1959. Shortly after that, you went to law school at New York University, and you've spent most of your career centered in the New York area, with one big exception that we'll talk about in just a moment. But before heading off to NYU Law, you had a job that in some ways sparked your life in securities regulation. Could you talk about that job and the impact it had on your career? Yes. I graduated from college in mid-year in January, and then I started law school the following September. So I had this hiatus of several months. And during that period of time, I worked in a small over-the-counter brokerage firm in Boston, Massachusetts. At that time, the firm was trading all of the securities of the businesses that ringed Route 128 that was a Silicon Valley of its day and some stodgy New England utilities. I took this job because my father was a lawyer, but he also was very interested in the stock market, used to talk to me both about law and the stock market. So I ended up being influenced by his conversations with me. And in that job, I was hired as an assistant to the security analyst, but most of the time I worked in the trading room. I was a very early risk manager type of personality in the trading room because my job uh, was to use a Frieden calculator to calculate the long and short positions of all the traders. There were six of them. They were supposed to be flat at the end of the day. So they used to shout out to me, can I take on this trade? Can I take on that trade? I'd say yes, no, maybe. And I learned a lot in that job because I learned the importance of not having too much leverage in the securities business. And I also learned something about the trading aspects of the securities business, all of which stood me in good stead later on in my career as a securities lawyer. When I left that position, the security analyst who I was supposed to be working for, said to me, why are you going to law school? You could have a great career in the securities business. Little did he know that's what happened to me. So in that role, you were officially the assistant to the securities analyst, but you had some experience in a way as a securities analyst yourself in that job. Could you maybe talk about that a little bit? Yes, he took me to an annual meeting of one of the companies that the firm was trading. They they were broker's broker. The other customers were other brokerage firms. So he took me to the annual meeting and the product seemed very esoteric to me. It had to do with the desalination of water. And when we got back to the firm, he said to me, you should write this up. I said, write it up. I don't know what to say. And he said, only bulls make money on Wall Street. So I went home and asked my husband who was an engineer to explain the product to me and what this desalination was all about. And I wrote something up. And much to my surprise, the next day when I was in the office, I found out they had sent this write-up to all of, of their customers, which were other broker dealers. So I learned something about the difference between what later became called the front office and the back office, or in terms of investment banking and trading and other back office functions also in that job. After a successful three years at NYU Law, you started your legal career as an SEC enforcement attorney. Could you talk about that early part of your career? What kinds of cases did you handle? What issues came up at the New York field office during those days? And what challenges did you face early on? Before I explain the job to you, maybe I should say the reason I took that job is because the big law firms were not hiring women by and large. And I was disappointed that I couldn't get a job at a big law firm. My colleague, Judith Smith, who later became chief judge of the Court of Appeal in New York, went to, I think, 20 
more interviews at big law firms. I said, why are you going there? They don't want us. I don't want to go somewhere that doesn't want me. And the SEC had some kind of an honors program and the New York office was hiring women. So that's how I got that job. And the kind of work I did was primarily taking testimony in investigations, building cases due to investigations. Most of our cases at that time in the New York office were cases against small broker dealers who were basically a net capital violation. This was a fallout from the -the over-the-counter market crash of the late 50s that led to the SEC special study, although I had nothing to do with the special study. But we were mopping up the mess on Wall Street left from that over-the-counter collapse. And also fraud cases involving boiler rooms. And it was a lot of fun. This was a time when the federal judges were very sympathetic to government attorneys, and we hardly ever had to try our cases in court. We would get injunctions just by going and filing the papers. Although I do remember one case, it was the first day that Judge Frankel, who became a very well-respected judge in the Southern District, it was the first day he was a judge. And he said, I don't know, I, I think we should have some sort of short trial before I sign these papers for a preliminary injunction. And he put the fraudster on the stand. I still remember him. He was uh, Leon Nash, Nash for cash. He ran his business. And after he testified, Judge Frankel said, I had my doubts about this case that these young people from the SEC had, but having heard your testimony, I have no doubts. I'm giving them their injunction. And this was par for the course by the way in which cases were not tried, but successful in the courts. We also did have administrative law cases, and those tended to be trials. And there was one case I worked on almost the entire time I was in the New York office that was very interesting and involved a case against several New York Stock Exchange member firms. At the time, this was considered very radical. I was even told, I don't know if we can authorize this case. It's against member firms. And I was so naive. I said, member firms, members of what? They did crooked things, didn't they? So that was a case that became quite a cause celeb in Washington and New York. And it's the case in which I really learned to be a lawyer because since the case was against respectable firms instead of the usual fly-by-night boiler firms that we were going against. There were excellent big law law firms on the other side, and this case went on and off. The trial went on and off for about a year, and I really learned so much working on that case, trying that case. And I should say that it was so complicated. The lawyer on the other side was a younger litigator that we thought was a partner. In fact, he was a senior associate about to become a partner. Later, he became a federal judge. And he and I were very well matched. I think both of us had a lot of fun (laughs) trying that case. So you were willing to take cases that were maybe outside the grain, that were a little bit harder and not necessarily part of the office tradition in terms of going after stock exchange member firms versus boiler rooms. And those efforts seem to have been rewarded because you were promoted to branch chief and ultimately also as assistant regional administrator in the New York SEC office. Could you talk about those experiences and how the transition from line enforcement lawyer to a supervisor uh, worked for you? I should say that most of the attorneys in that New York office at that time were very young, just barely out of law school. In the Eisenhower years, there had been six enforcement attorneys in the New York office. In the Kennedy years, that expanded to 30. So it was almost like a kind of graduate school for us. And I became a branch chief, I think, because I think it was merit, (laughs) but I like to think that. And then my idea of being a supervisor of a branch was that we were going to try and be the best branch in the office. I think there were four at that time. And we were a very cohesive group and we did a good job. And in Part because of that, I was rewarded as becoming an assistant regional administrator. And then I had two branches under my supervision. This consisted of half a dozen lawyers and the same number of 
investigators and also the managing clerk's office. That was a little bizarre. The managing clerk had much more idea of what his job was than I did. And the investigators were primarily men who had gotten into the securities business often in the 1930s. And little thereafter, they had street smarts. They understood how the securities business ran, but they were not necessarily college educated. And at first, they seemed to think that a woman like me, who I I should I should interrupt here and say, I had three children while I was working in the New York office in the 1960s. So they thought a woman like me, who was always pregnant, had little babies at home, shouldn't be working. But at the same time, they respected me and the other attorneys because we were lawyers. In addition to that, at some point when I was either branch chief or I think probably assistant regional administrator, I managed to get the investigators reclassified from GS-13 to GS-14. You'd have to be a government lawyer to understand that maybe. And then they would do anything for me, anything at all. I was really their, their heroine. Seven years out of law school, you had already been a successful securities litigator for the government and a successful administrator and supervisor of these different groups of people, the lawyers and investigators. You then decided to transition to private practice. Could you maybe talk a little bit about your motivation for that and what challenges you faced there and how maybe that shifted your perceptions a little bit from what might have formed while you were working for the government? Most of my friends who were in the New York office with me left at that point. It was, this was the bull market of the late 1960s. And most of them had to look for a job for maybe a week or two and they would get a job. Many of them became the first in-house legal compliance officers of brokerage firms. I mention this because many years later, many of them became my clients. (laughs) It was part of how I built a practice later on. And I felt a little left behind. I was also getting bored with fraud cases. They all seemed to be pretty much the same. And I had always wanted to work in a law firm anyway. I always had this idea, that's how you become a real lawyer. That was probably an erroneous idea. I think a lot of people who are in the government or in-house are real lawyers today. But at the time, I thought that was the route to becoming my conception of a real lawyer. However, it was extremely difficult for me to land a job in a law firm. I looked for an entire year before I got any offers. It was a very frustrating period. I can remember going to interviews with firms that either took the position they didn't hire women, or maybe there was one firm that said, we're ready for a woman associate, but not a woman partner. And you're probably so ambitious that you want to become a partner. It was a very frustrating time. But I finally got actually two job offers on the very same day. (laughs) and I could choose which one I was going to take. Which one did you choose and how did your practice and private law firm take off from there? Was it what you had hoped it would be or was it different? Yes and no. I chose Wilkie Farr and Gallagher. I worked primarily for a Kenneth Bialkin, who became a real mentor to me in terms of my learning to be a lawyer and becoming what, in my mind, a real lawyer. We had a lot of extremely interesting cases that I worked on. The primary client of Kenny was Sandy Weil. And at the time, the firm that he was in was called CBWL. The C was Marshall Kogan, who left the securities business. The B was Roger Berlin, who had a personal tragedy and became a very successful Broadway producer, also leaving the securities business. The Weil was Sandy Weil. The L was Arthur Levitt, who later became chairman of the SEC. So this was an interesting group of Wall Street leaders. And one of the most interesting matters that I worked on was the acquisition by CBWL of Hayden Stone, which was an old line very large securities firm, which was going under. This was a time when a lot of big firms were going under because of the paperwork crisis, because they transitioned from paper records to computer records, and they did a very bad job of that. They lost control of their books and records. And Hayden Stone was so big 
that CBWL had to go onto their book. And this was a problem because they had a lot of what at the time were called short differences, which were a problem where the securities listed in customer accounts just weren't there. And that was taken care of in this deal by Frank Zarb, who also later went on to bigger and better things as head of the NASD. And he and I worked on a proposal where any accounts with short differences would be returned to a vehicle that had been set up by the New York Stock Exchange for the bad bank vehicle. So this was an extremely interesting matter. I always say it led to my day of the greatest power I ever had on Wall Street as follows, is that there was some question as to whether this deal was really going to be closed because of some um, recalcitrant subordinated lenders. And I had the job of calling the New York Stock Exchange on the morning after the evening when it was going to close, if it was going to close, to tell them whether the exchange could open because if the deal had not closed, the stock exchange was not going to open that day because Hayden Stone's name would not be recognized on the floor. So this was, as I say, my moment of great power. I got to call the New York Stock Exchange and tell them that the exchange could open in the morning. A year later, we worked on the public offering of CBW Hayden Stone. And in general, I worked on a lot of broker dealer matters for a lot of clients who in the years after that were absorbed by Sandy Weil. <laughs> kind of all these smaller brokerage firms finally became a huge conglomerate. But I didn't stay there for all of that. I also worked on some hedge fund matters. Basically, I was a regulatory lawyer. When you were originally interviewing for law firm positions, some folks speculated that you had ambitions of being a law firm partner. Was that true? And did that happen for you? Oh, it didn't work out at Wilkie Farr. And I became extremely frustrated. And then I was lucky enough to be able to transition to Rogers and Wells as a partner. I got tired of waiting on Volkifar to make me a partner. I'm not sure they ever would have, actually. Although Ken Bialkin kept asking me to wait and said, eventually you will become a partner. But they had never had a woman partner. I don't think they had a woman partner for a number of years after that. And a client of mine called Moore & Schley, a smaller brokerage firm, was a client of Rogers & Wells and through the good offices of their then inside counsel and partner who had been one of the branch chiefs for me when I was assistant regional administrator, knew that I was unhappy at Wilkie Farr and helped me get to Rogers & Wells. And then Moore & Schley was one of my major clients at Rogers and Wells. That's a, it's a longer story than that, but that's the short version. So you had achieved your goal of becoming a law firm partner. You'd done a lot in government service. And then in 1977, a really, really big day happens for any securities lawyer. You were appointed by President Jimmy Carter to become a commissioner of the SEC, the first woman in that agency's 43-year history up to that point to be appointed to that position. I wondered if you could talk a little bit about the process, one, deciding that you wanted to be an SEC commissioner the process of how does one become an SEC commissioner, and maybe the momentous reality that you were the first woman in this position. This all started at an American Bar Association meeting. At that point, I had become somewhat active in the Securities Regulation Committee of the American Bar Association. Um, Also, the Association of the Bar, this was partly due to Ken Bialkin's influence and also my father's influence. He told me, if you want to be a successful lawyer, you should become active in bar associations because you really need to have your own clients. And that's one route to that objective. So I had become someone active in the ABA and we were at an ABA meeting and people were joking, saying, I understand President Carter is looking for a woman for the SEC. What do you think of that? I said, no, I would love that job. I think it's a dream job for any securities lawyer. And and then a couple of people said, are you serious? Are you serious? Would you take it? I said, of course I would take it. So that's how this all started. 
And then I kind of didn't really know what to do from there. But I did talk to one of my partners at Rogers and Wells, who was active in democratic politics. I said, some friends are suggesting I try and become an SEC commissioner. I don't have any idea how to go about that. And he said, you have to get a letter from some politician to the White House to get this started. I said, I don't know any politicians. I don't know how to do that. But then it occurred to me that Al Del Bello, who was the Westchester County executive, lived in Hastings, and a friend of mine worked for him. So I called her up and I said, do you think Al Del Bello send a letter to the White House for me recommending me as an SEC commissioner? She said, I'll ask him. Well, he did. It was actually, this is a longer, more complicated story because in that process, I was also nominated by Governor Kerry to go onto the board of the MTA, of all things. And I was one of 105 Kerry appointees, never approved by the New York State Republican legislature. But I had some adventures in that role, including christening the first electrified train to go up to Brewster, New York. There's a picture of me that I always had in my office christening this train with a lot of the local Westchester politicians surrounding me, advising me on how to break the bottle of champagne on the train, which then splattered all over all of us. But I'd say that was a kind of sideshow to my efforts to become an SEC commissioner. And I think the Carter administration was quite different than the way things necessarily are today, because I didn't have to prove that I had raised a lot of money for Carter, or even that I'd voted for him, but I had. Some of the people who were active in the American Bar Association, and particularly Ken Bialkin, promoted me to the White House. And there really had been a search for a female securities lawyer to be named to the SEC. And there had also been pressure on the White House to name a lawyer from New York. There was a feeling at that time that New York interests had been neglected at the SEC and in the White House. And to be honest, there were not that many New York female lawyers who had the kind of credentials that were probably necessary for the job. I then had some other lucky breaks in that the staffer at the White House who was reviewing some of the candidates happened to be a college friend of one of my partners at Rogers and Wells. So that was good. And I don't entirely know how I got this job, but I was interviewed personally by President Carter, and that was a very exciting day in my life. I found out later on that this was unusual, that the president did not usually interview SEC commissioners as opposed to SEC chairman. I was also interviewed by the then chair of the SEC, Harold Williams. I flew down to Washington one day to have dinner with him or lunch, I can't remember, and flew back. And I thought, oh, I'm a real jet setter now. I got to fly to Washington and back in one day. I did that many times in the years that followed. But at the time, I found that very exciting. And in fact, his assistant called me up and said, what kind of food do you like to eat? I said, I eat anything. I don't care where you make a reservation. I was so excited to meet the chairman. And we had a good talk. And my talk with President Carter was also extremely interesting. I was amazed that I was being interviewed by the president of the United States. And somewhere in the middle of the interview, I thought, oh, this is a job interview by the President of the United States. I hope I'm doing okay. And I guess I did, because at the end of the interview, he asked me, as I think is a typical question, do you have any reservations about taking this job? And I said, it's now July. It was the 4th of July weekend, actually. I said, it's now July. This has been going on for many months. I have four children. If we're going to move to Washington, they have to start school in September. And so I really have to know if I'm going to have this job or not. And he said, well, I guess you have it. I said, great. And I told, he said, but don't tell anybody. I said, can I tell my husband? He, oh, yeah, you can tell your husband. The next day, this was a front page item in the newspapers that I, I was beginning to learn a little about how Washington worked. You didn't realize that you're going to be interviewed by the president of the United States, but it seems like no, you aced no the interview. Idea. And it seems like you, if you can pass that interview, you can probably do well in, in the interview. It actually changed my life in that sense, because whenever I had to do anything after that, 
that seem difficult in terms of either a speech or action at the SEC, I used to think to myself, I was interviewed by the president of the United States for this job and I passed. So I don't need to be afraid of anybody anymore. Did he give you any advice in that interview? He suggested that I had to be very strong. And I think the implication was from the conversation that I had to be strong in dealing with the enforcement division. I know that was something that was talked about in connection with this appointment. That leads me to my next question. At the top of the conversation, I mentioned that you spent most of your career in New York and with one big exception, and obviously your service on the SEC was that one big exception. In a Maryland Law Review essay that you wrote a few years ago, you described your time on the commission as being sometimes lonely. First, what was it like being a commissioner? Were you in the thick of it like you were when you were in the New York office, or was it more of a solitary type of work that you did? How did this differ from your life as a private practice securities lawyer in New York? And what made the experience sometimes a lonely one for you? I think there were two reasons why it was somewhat lonely. One was I was about a generation younger than the other four commissioners. Plus, because of the Sunshine Act, we could not all meet together to discuss any matters outside of a formal commission meeting. So I didn't have that much contact with the other commissioners, although sometimes I would have private conversations with the chairman. So this was very different from a situation in the government on the staff or in a law firm with partners where you could discuss what was on your mind with your colleague. In addition to that, I felt very cut off from what was happening on Wall Street. Before I went to the commission, particularly in the years when I was working in the Chase Manhattan building, I could go on the plaza of the Chase Manhattan building and meet numerous people that I knew and get gossip what was happening on Wall Street while in the government, I, I couldn't really talk to my friends in New York. And to the extent that I did go to conferences or conventions or give speeches, I felt very constrained. And I think my friends felt very constrained from talking to me because because I was in the government, because I was a commissioner. And while some people did come to the commission and and lobby about some of the matters that the commission was considering, these were not my friends. I mean, these were not the lawyers that I knew or the clients that I knew on Wall Street. These were the people running big organizations or self-regulatory organizations or lobbyists. So I felt like I don't really know what's happening on Wall Street. And here I am supposedly regulating all of this. And there were some very controversial issues involving the regulation of the securities markets. So I felt everything was very formalistic at that point. And also I was having problems with the enforcement people. What were some of those problems that you had? And and you talk about being a big era for a number of regulatory issues in Wall Street. What were some of those issues and where did you fall in the commission's resolution of those problems? Well, off-board trading was a big issue. And really the regulation of the New York Stock Exchange and the regulation of New York Stock Exchange firms, self-regulatory organization matters, particularly in the wake of the adjustment by Wall Street firms to the end of fixed commissions. This was a time of great turmoil on Wall Street. And the commission was charged in the 1975 Act Amendments to the Exchange Act, passed only two years before I became a commissioner, to implementing regulation of the national market system. So these were the very controversial issues. Actually, the chairman and I pretty much saw eye to eye on all of those issues. I didn't have problems with that, but the staff and some of the other commissioners did not see eye to eye on those issues. And I felt they were, uh, some of the people at the commission were out to destroy the New York Stock Exchange. And I didn't think that was appropriate action for a government agency, even though the exchange was not necessarily reacting the way it could have to the unfixing of commission rates. So those were the regulatory issues. Also, there was the options moratorium. There were corporate governance issues. And in those, I became quite almost 
unwittingly a controversial person because the chairman and staff members were trying to push the idea of public company boards of 100% independent directors. And I really didn't see how the SEC had the authority to do that under the securities laws later on, much later on in Sarbanes-Oxley in 2002, the SEC got that authority. But in 1977, 78, 79, I didn't see how we had the authority to do anything like that. I also was a little skeptical about whether that was the best possible arrangement, corporate governance arrangement for public companies, even if we somehow had the authority. So it became the center of controversy that I really had never intended to be or thought I was going to be. In questioning the SEC's authority to take certain steps, you, as you mentioned, you became the unwitting center of controversy, and you also became maybe an unintentional procedural innovator. Could you talk about your dissents at the commission and how those were taken at the time and maybe how dissent practice has developed since then? Yeah, there were a number of issues. One had to do with Wells reports or Wells submissions, which were an opportunity given to targets of an SEC investigation to tell their side of the story to the commission before an enforcement case was authorized. I refused to authorize cases where the staff had not permitted a Wells submission to be submitted. So that, I don't know if that's what you mean by procedural innovations or not. In addition to that, I was against the use of 21A reports, which were reports of investigation to end an SEC enforcement case. At that time, the SEC did not have cease and desist authority. This was not exactly a cease and desist authority, but it was like that. And I felt that it was an enforcement action, a penalty, and that the use of these 21A reports, which were supposed to be reports of investigation, was being abused by being utilized in cases where I believed if the SEC had gone to court, the commission would not have prevailed. To me, these were very borderline cases on the law. I guess I would say, even as an SEC commissioner, I continued to be a securities lawyer. And so I looked at enforcement cases and regulatory matters through that lens. And this was not always so popular with staffers who thought law is an instrument of social policy and we should just right all the wrongs that we see in the securities markets, whether we have the authority or not. There was one famous interchange at the commission table where the head of enforcement said to me, why do you care so much of what the courts think and not what I think? I said, I I believe that's my job. (laughs) Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that you were the first commissioner to issue a written dissent from commission actions or decisions. What motivated you to do that? And how was that received? I was not the first commissioner to ever do that. However, I believe I was the first one after Watergate to do it because the commission became sadly embroiled in Watergate scandal and circled the wagons after that and tried to eliminate any kind of controversy at the commission or criticism by outside forces or the newspapers uh, trying to prove we're tough enforcers and and that's that. Yes, after that period of time, I was the first one to issue written dissents. And in fact, the first time I tried to issue a dissent in a rulemaking proceeding, and this was one of these corporate governance actions, I was told by the secretary of the commission, you can't do that. There's no procedure for that. And I said, at the end of every commission action, it says by the commission, and I'm part of the commission. I'm one of five, and I don't agree to this. It seems to me I have some kind of right to say that somehow, somewhere. And the way we did it in that first time that I dissented, we just dropped a little footnote from one sentence saying, Commissioner Carmel does not agree with this sentence. (laughs) But it caused such a furor. I was astonished. I was just astonished by the furor that this caused. Then when it came to some of the 
settlement of 21A actions and also cases against securities lawyers, I actually issued kind of brief written dissents. Later on, this became a matter of routine, and it became very partisan. And I was sad to see that and thought, well, if I contribute to this partisanship, I'm really sorry. But at the time, it wasn't particularly partisan. It was just my instincts or my analysis as a lawyer that the commission was doing something that I disagreed with from a legal perspective. I guess I continued to be a securities lawyer, even though I was commissioner. You wore your securities lawyer's hat as a commissioner and let that guide your decisions and your views on the commission's work. By the time that you were a commissioner, you became a commissioner about when you were 40 years old, you'd already achieved a lot as a staff enforcement lawyer, as a supervisor at the SEC, and then as a practitioner, as a partner at a law firm. In all those roles, you wore your securities lawyer hat. But I wondered if those different roles required you to look at securities law differently if they challenged perceptions that you had in previous experiences and how the combination of those three early experiences shaped you today and how you view securities regulation. I would say I didn't view my work as a commissioner just as a securities lawyer. There were obviously policy perspective applied to all of this too. And yes, I think there were different policy perspectives, political perspectives that I had as a staffer and then in private practice and then as a commissioner. When I was on the staff, I had this kind of bias that all the people on Wall Street are crooks because that's how the staff thought in terms at least of the cases that we were investigating and making up. And this did become part of the problem I think I had when I was a commissioner because if some of the leaders in enforcement had been there when I was on the staff and their attitude was, oh, she was a great enforcement attorney. Now she's going to help us bring all kinds of novel cases. And I felt that wasn't my job anymore. And in addition to that, when I was in private practice, I came to realize that not everybody on Wall Street is a crook. There are a lot of people doing jobs on Wall Street who are perfectly honorable men and women. And sometimes the government is wrong when it brings cases against them. And the government has so much power compared to the individuals in the securities business. And that changed my attitude. I became more concerned about abuse of government power than hanky-panky on Wall Street, although that certainly was something I didn't approve of. And the attitude, I think, of some of the staffers at the SEC when I was a commissioner was, oh, she's been corrupted by private practice. I didn't feel I'd been corrupted. I felt that I altered some of my opinions because of the realities that I came in contact with as a private practitioner. Not to say that all my clients over all the years I was in practice were completely honorable. Some of them deserved to to be investigated and prosecuted by the government. But still, I think I had a more balanced view of how the SEC and the private sector should interact and how the SEC should bring cases against Wall Street personalities. I also felt that too often the SEC brings cases against the little guys and lets the big guys off. I think this is a persistent problem, and I think it persists to this very day. And some of the clients I had in those years were the little guys, and sometimes I felt they were being unfairly prosecuted where their bosses got off or where the firms they were working for got off. So I would say my perspective changed over the years, and it's continued to change to this day because given what's going on in the world today, I would say I have a somewhat different perspective than I had back in the 1970s. I have seen, I think, too much private sector power exerted on agency like the SEC and the other agencies in Washington, which has somewhat paralyzed their ability to engage in rulemaking. A lot of my philosophy as a commissioner was changes in the law should come by way of rulemaking instead of enforcement cases. But Now I realize how very difficult it is for independent agencies like the SEC to engage in good rulemaking. There's too much private sector power exerted. And I think 
too much recourse to the federal courts to overturn rulemaking. It's like a second bite at the apple by certain business interests that I think is inappropriate. I've written about this as a scholar in later years. This is all segueing us into your life as a securities scholar and a securities teacher, which will be the focus of our next interview. But I want to set that up a little bit. After you left the SEC, you returned to Rogers and Wells. You practiced there for a number of years. During this time, you published scholarship in the security space, and you ultimately decided to become a full-time law professor at Brooklyn Law School, joining the faculty in 1985. What motivated you to take this academic turn? I had always wanted to be an academic, but the academic world, up until about the mid 80s, and even after that, quite close to women. I think it was the last bastion of male privilege in the law to open up. So that was not something I was able to do in my younger years. And maybe that was just as well, because I had a great career up until that point. And when I returned to private practice, I built up a very large, very successful practice. But I was always a little frustrated by being in a big white shoe law firm as to whether that was the best thing to do with my life. And in the mid 80s, I had a variety of political problems at the law firm that made me think I had to move from Rogers and Wells to somewhere else. I did interview with a number of other law firms at the time, but I decided that really I did not want to redo my career the way it had been, that I did want to go into the academic world. And I called up David Traeger, who was then dean of Brooklyn Law School, and said, David, you've been trying to entice me to come to Brooklyn Law School for a long time since I was an adjunct at the school. This is your chance. If you can make me an offer so that I can start next September, I'll come. And to my amazement now, he got a telephone meeting of the faculty together, and they made me an offer. And in fact, he said, we've already scheduled the classes for next year. I can break up contracts or torts. Which do you want? I said, I'll take torts. <laughs> and that's how I started teaching at Brooklyn Law School. And I'm very happy that I did. I've had a great career there. The school has always been as good to me as David Traeger was in hiring me. And it turned out to be a very good place for my career and also at Brooklyn Law School, I was able to continue in practice as a part-time partner of another law firm and also continue with my boards of directors, which was an important part of my career and a part that I enjoyed very much. So altogether, I think it's been a pretty happy marriage. I'm excited about talking about this next stage of your career in our next conversation, focusing on your scholarship and your role as a teacher. Until then, we will adjourn. This has been an interview with Roberta Carmel, professor of law at Brooklyn Law School, as part of a two-part interview with her about her career as a securities lawyer, scholar, teacher, and regulator. Roberta, until the next time, thank you for joining the Business Scholarship Podcast. Thank you for asking me all these questions so that I could talk about myself, something lawyers always like to do. It's been my pleasure. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Business Scholarship Podcast. If you like what you heard, please consider subscribing to the podcast or leaving a rating on your favorite podcast app, or let other people know about it too. If you have suggestions for future episodes, please let me know. My email address is andrew at andrewkjennings.com, and I look forward to hearing from you. Until the next time, I'm your host, Andrew Jennings.